The gospel reading this morning is taken from Mark chapter 3, verses 20 through 35. Jesus entered a house, and the crowd gathered again, so that they were not even able to eat. When his family heard this, they set out to restrain him. Because they said, he's out of his mind. You can stop right there and have a message, but we'll continue on. The scribes who had come down from Jerusalem said, he's possessed by Beelzebul, and he drives out demons by the ruler of the demons. So Jesus summoned them and spoke to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is finished. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Then he can plunder his house. I tell you the truth, people will be forgiven for all sins and whatever blasphemies they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. Because they were saying he has an unclean spirit. His mother and brothers came and standing outside, they sent word to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him and told him, look, your mother and brothers and your sisters are outside asking for you. He replied to them, who are my mother and my brothers? Looking at those sitting in a circle around him, he said, here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and sister and mother. This, the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please be seated as we go into the message today. I've entitled uh, today's message, Time to Remember Christmas, and uh, hopefully that will make sense as we go into, uh, into the Word today. Let's pray as we go into God's Word. Thank you, Father, for your Word. Your Word is truth, and we thank you for your Spirit. You died just so that we could have your Spirit that you would send your spirit into this world and into our hearts and minds to open the scriptures that we may be able to see what we cannot see without your spirit quickening ours to hear the truth of your word that we could not hear without your spirit opening our ears. And like the wind, may your spirit move upon us and may we have obedient hearts to go wherever you desire us to go and to fulfill your will. This we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This scripture that we read today is prominent, not only in Mark, but it's in Matthew and Luke as well. It's in the 12th chapter of Mark. It's in the 11th chapter of Luke. It's, it's something that each gospel holds because it's very important in terms of what took place and what he taught. And to understand the context, I'd like to go back to Luke chapter 2, verse 8. In that same region, shepherds were staying out in the fields and keeping watch at night over their flock. Not really a, a sacred gathering, kind of hanging out with the sheep and the goats. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, don't be afraid, for look, I proclaim to you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the city of David, a Savior was born for you, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be the sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped tightly in cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly 
there was a multitude of the heavenly host with the angel praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth to people he favors. Throughout all of scripture, that word host, the God of hosts, in Hebrew and in Greek, is the God of armies. That God is breaking into this world and the celestial beings that are at his side are waiting for his command. Praise God because he has brought into this world a savior, a spiritual warrior that will tear down the works of Satan that will set the captives free, that will come into this world proclaiming victory in God's name and through him and through the spirit working through him will demonstrate his authority to proclaim the kingdom of God with every miracle he does, every person that is healed. And he will give us his spirit and his spirit will empower us to see who he truly is through faith. It is a military proclamation. Suddenly, there was a multitude of the heavenly hosts. It's the same host that led Israel through the desert. It's the same heavenly host that stands at God's right hand. Jesus says at the cross, do you not know if I wanted to, I could call on the heavenly host and there would be multitude of angels that would come down and wipe out all. And we know from the Old Testament that one angel can wipe out thousands. Very powerful message, very powerful proclamation. And that is the background for what Jesus begins to demonstrate in Mark. The first thing, as he comes out of the desert, he proclaims the kingdom of heaven is near. He grabs recruits. And then they go to Capernaum in the 21st verse of that first chapter. And it says right away, he didn't wait. He entered the synagogue on a Sabbath and began to teach. And just then a man with an unclean spirit was in their synagogue. He cried out, what do you have to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? And he cast him out. And it's the first time in all of scripture that that's ever happened. This man that's been bound by influences of the unclean spirit. It's all over the world various voices. And that starts a ministry where he does this routinely and regularly to the point that when we get to where we read today in chapter three, he enters a house and it's so packed with people that they can't eat. Now that's, <laughs> I don't know about you, but I can eat in pretty cramped quarters. Ever taken an airplane? I can cut it up. I'm good. I'm good. You know, and they can't eat place is packed because the spirit is moving in such a profound way that people are drawn to it. And it's not a church. It's not a synagogue even. It's just someone's home. It's powerful what God can do in people's homes. And so he is there. It's packed. But when his family hears this, they set out to restrain him. Because they said, he's out of his mind. He's crazy. And he's an embarrassment. We don't want him doing this publicly. There's a manner of how things are to be done. There's protocol. There's tradition. You grow up in the school. You study under this person. These people have authority because they too have studied. And you go through the socially accepted way of moving according to God's spirit. A socially accepted way that was created by man, not God, with very good intentions. Nonetheless, it did not come from God. And so he's doing something that is bringing dis, disgrace to a degree to Mary's public image of who she thinks her son should be. 
And it's the one thing that the devil is very skilled at doing is planting within our minds, what will other people think about us? Especially in the church, especially in God's synagogue, because we're supposed to be better than those who do not know God. And so he works this angle. So much so that Mary is moved to take all of her family and go as only a mother can go. I brought you into this world, you know, to take charge of them. Think about the resistance, the spiritual resistance that Jesus is facing. When his own family, the ones who are supposed to affirm him and support him and be behind him, do not believe in him. Not now anyway. Now it's not a mistake that Jesus went into the desert for 40 days and 40 nights. Praying and fasting. What do you do for 40 days and 40 nights? We have a culture that's run on being busy. If we're not busy, we'll find something to do. The idea of being able to sit and listen to God can be frightening in this culture. We're not doing something. We're not being productive. We got to do something. We'll find something. But you go into the desert and it says the spirit led him. The spirit brought him into what we would call boot camp. And one of the most fundamental skills is to be able to hear the Spirit of God in any condition, in any situation, so that He can lead. In the same way that if you are in some kind of military engagement and there's just things exploding and it's too loud and you can't even hear yourself talk to the person that's next to you because it's too loud and it's just bang and you just can't think because it's too loud. You must rely on your training. And when those spiritual bombs explode, when someone doesn't like what you're doing, when someone thinks you're crazy, when someone tries to put shame and, and, and uh, ill repute onto you, when someone tries to intimidate you, when someone tries to make you afraid, when some, whatever the bomb may be, you need to be able to listen to the Spirit of God or you will be cowered into abandoning the mission. Spiritual cowardice is a skill that the enemy tries to employ. And so in this case... Not only are the Jews from Jerusalem and scribes who had come down from Jerusalem. Jerusalem is the spiritual headquarters of Israel. It's like if you're Roman Catholic and somebody is sent from Rome. They come down and they say he's possessed. He drives out demons by the ruler of demons. That's, that's his power. And then he gives this, this parable. So Jesus summoned them and spoke to them and said this, how can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. In other words, Satan has a kingdom. Jesus comes at the beginning of, of Mark, Mark chapter 1, proclaiming the kingdom of God. And there's two kingdoms. You're either in one or the other, but there's no Switzerland. You don't get out of it. You're either in service to one unknowingly, or you're in service to one knowingly, or you're in service to the other knowingly. And the whole universe then is defined by this spiritual reality that has an effect in this world. Which is why when Mary and her brothers are going to take charge of Jesus, it begs the question, what voice are they listening to? 
because I don't think Mary would do that with any ill intent. I think she had good intent. I think she was trained to think a certain way and that way was being offended. And as such, that voice within her mind, she didn't come up with this on her own. Some influence moved her to do that. It's already this cosmic conflict on display in this, in this story. So the scribes are saying, we know, we know the, 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 the cosmic reality of the universe. We know that there's the enemy. And actually, Jesus is working for the enemy. And Jesus gives this parable, not just in Mark, but like I said, Luke and Matthew as well. The, that Satan has a kingdom. Now, here's the thing about a kingdom. A kingdom is whatever you have say over. So if I have say over my car, my car is my kingdom. If you have say over your house, your house is your kingdom. If I was to go into Sheila's purse and start digging through things, it would be a trespass because that's her kingdom. Now, if she was to say, hey, I need you to do me a favor, go in and get my phone. I have now permission to go in and it's no longer a trespass. So sinning against each other, we say, and forgive us our trespasses. So whatever we have say over is our kingdom. If God has say over it, it's his kingdom. If Satan has say over it, it's his kingdom. Now, Satan can't do anything original because he's a creature. He's not a creator. He doesn't create anything. He's a created being. So the only thing he can do is copy. And if God has a kingdom, he'll just copy the order of it. And he's got unclean spirits, as the scriptures say. He's got unwilling people that are used by him to exert his will. This is the kingdom of Satan, whatever he has say over. Then, as Jesus is giving this parable, he goes on to say, if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but is finished. There's that word stand again. It's a posture We'll get back to that in a second, but just take note of that, of that verse. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his possessions unless he first ties up the strong man. Who's the strong man in this one? Anybody remember the Wednesday? Yes, yeah, Satan. He's the strong man. And he's stolen stuff from God, primarily God's human family. He's stolen it. We are, in re we are what we call in sin or in rebellion. He's stolen. We are in captive. As Jesus says in the Gospel of John, anyone who sins is a slave to sin. A slave has no permanent place in the house or in the family. So Jesus is saying nobody can Take what Satan has stolen unless he overpowers Satan. And only then is he able to set what has been stolen and had held captive by Satan free. And it is, it is Jesus who sets the captives free by the Holy Spirit. Now, this is a very profound teaching because... Whatever God has say over is God's kingdom, is part of God's kingdom. And it starts then with the mind. Remember the proclamation that Jesus proclaimed throughout his entire ministry from the very beginning. The kingdom of God is at hand. Repent, which is to change. Now, we can't do it all on our own, 
but we can commit to working with the Holy Spirit to change. And before anything is possible for us to do outside of ourselves, God changes us from the inside by taking anything that is not of his spirit, any voice that is not of God, and removing it. As he did in the beginning of his ministry with Mark, there was a man with an unclean spirit. A spi I don't... And I don't think it does us justice when we translate it in English. He was possessed by a spirit because the, the grammar is not, doesn't indicate that. It's more of a he's influenced by an unclean spirit, almost like demonized as compared to demon possessed. He's influenced by it. Here's a man in Mark that believes in God, does the creed, the Shema in, in Hebrew, goes to synagogue, is a believer, and yet is still in bondage to an unclean spirit until Jesus sets him free through the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is a profound thing because he just doesn't do it one time. He does it over and over and over and over again to both Jews and Gentiles, to both those that are in synagogue and those that are in people's homes. And he does so by the power of the Holy Spirit, by first drawing whatever that spirit is into the light. Who are you? You see, the way that Satan works is very subtle. And as we see in the scripture, in the dark. He's, it's called, it, uh, as the scripture says, for God has rescued us from the powers or kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of light. He can only work in the dark, which means we don't even know that he's at work in our lives. It's just happening and we're unaware of it. It's called, for example, worry. Let's see what Jesus has to, as an example, let's see what Jesus has to teach regarding worry. This is Matthew chapter 6, verse 25. I'll use this as an example. Therefore, I tell you, don't worry about your life. Let's just stop right there. <laughs> We don't need to get specific. Don't worry. Now, this is an imperative in, in, in the grammatic way of saying things, meaning it's a command. And Jesus isn't going to give us a command if he's not going to teach us how to follow through on the command. It'd be kind of cruel to do that. So what he says is, therefore, don't worry about your life, what you're going to eat, what you're going to drink, or about your body, including what you're going to wear. How many of you worry about your body? I must have that. I just saw it on TV. What is that? Is that something I don't know about? How many of you go to the doctor for a checkup and go, I'm not worried at all. Don't worry about your body including what you're going to eat, where your health, God has it. Well, that comes across as dumb. Aren't you concerned? Well, concerned is not the same as worry. And it can actually be offensive to those who have befriended a spirit of worry. And if you befriend a spirit of worry, I only know this because I've had to deal with this. If you befriend a spirit of worry, that spirit of worry will try to find someone else that worries just as much as you. And now you can commiserate together. Ever done that? Yeah. So what happens then in this case? You keep, you keep going. Talks about the goodness of the father. Look, because of the birds of the sky, they don't sow or reap. Yet your fa heavenly father feeds them. Aren't you worth more than they? And the enemy says, no. He goes on. For the Gentiles eagerly seek all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God. Seek first, which is whatever he has say over. In order to seek his kingdom, one must be aware and familiar with his voice. 
And if you can hear his voice, then all other spirits are not allowed in your presence. See, now, as Paul says so eloquently and so wonderfully and so beautifully, we are the temple of God and the Holy Spirit dwells within us. There is no room because God is a jealous God for any unclean spirit to dwell here or here. And so he teaches us how to do that. The first thing is to teach us how not to allow certain voices into our mind. Don't allow that thought into your mind. Because the enemy, as we've just seen in Genesis 3, is very subtle and just comes in and does not present himself as some ogre, some disfigured, some, you know, vampirish kind of looking ghoul. As it says in the scripture, he's a beautiful angel, presents himself as an angel of light. He is grand. He was a cherub with splendor. And who wouldn't trust a voice from somebody that presents themselves like that? And then just subtly puts this idea into your mind and skillfully plants the idea until that idea bears fruit of fear in your body. You don't fear, feel, feel fear from here on up. You think feel, you think rather fear here up and you feel it here, but it doesn't belong in your body. You can, you can remove, not by yourself, but through the Holy Spirit, remove fear from your body. This is part of discipleship. 365 times in the scripture, God says to various people and peoples, don't be afraid. If he says, don't be afraid, sometimes our immediate reaction is, you're trying to comfort us, but I'm still going to stay in fear because I don't know how to get rid of it. But God says, no, do not fear. Don't let it come into your body. Don't let it come into your, don't even let it, because your body is mine. I, you're, you're a temple of which I dwell in. I can remove that. And that takes a while to understand, but you got to be able to hear his voice. And if the only voice that we've been conditioned to hear are the various unclean spirits that are in the air, as Paul says, they're everywhere. It is almost impossible to hear his voice. In fact, I'll say it is impossible. And the only way to be able to hear his voice is to be quiet and listen and intently ask God to speak to you. And he'll speak through his word. The best way to meditate and the best way to get rid of, to train the mind in being able to discern what's of God and what's not of God and how to train your mind, how not to think. Have you ever tried to not think about worry when you're worrying? How do you do it, right? This is how you do it. I'm telling you how you do it. You begin to memorize scripture. Man, I'm really afraid about this guy. Hang on a second. I'm just going to focus on the word. In the beginning was the word. And yeah, but you know what, Steve? This, is, this could ruin your life. And the, and the word was with God. No, if this person says this, they're going to, no. And, and, and there's 15 minutes, I'll go by 10 minutes, where the enemy is just trying to pummel my mind. And I can't even meditate on the word. But because he's faithful, he teaches all disciples how to remove that. It doesn't happen overnight. But every single trial and tribulation that comes our way is an opportunity and is God training us how to hear his voice and respond accordingly. And after you begin to recognize his voice versus an unclean voice, a disciple will be able to not only reject the voice that's trying to get your attention, but also reject the spiritual influences that reside in your body because they don't belong there either. 
And in the name of Jesus, you can just be gone. That doesn't happen overnight. But when, when, when Jesus says, don't worry, he means just that. If you follow me, you will get to a place where no matter what comes your way, you will never, ever have to be captive to worry. Ever. That doesn't mean it's not going to try to come in repeatedly, especially when you're not on guard. Especially if you're tired. Especially if you're weary. Especially if you're worn out. But those voices that one has been listening to of the world do not give up easily. They're little buggers and they'll stick with you. And most of the time they come in when, when uh, we least expect it in our younger years. And we don't even recognize that it's not of God. It's just, well, their personality is to worry. Ever, ever thought that? That's just their personality type. No, it's not. Somebody taught them that. And even if it is, God transforms people. You don't have to worry. Well, that's really arrogant. No, it's not arrogant. It's a promise. So when Jesus is healing repeatedly and casting out unclean spirits, the people that are against him chalk it up to him being the king of Satan. And that Jesus takes that opportunity to say, no, there's two kingdoms. And I, I'm taking over and tying up the strong man and, and setting him free. And then his mother and his brothers came and they're standing outside. See, he can't get a break. Can't get a break. If it's not his disciples trying to sway him according to human thought, it's his family. And so the crowd sitting around him and they said, look, your mom's here. You better uh, sit up straight and fly right. He replies, who are my mother and my brothers? That is a powerful statement. Because I've heard time and time again, family is the most important. What family? What family? The fellowship of the Holy Spirit brings together people that transcend blood lines. As the Gospel of John says in the first chapter, but those who received him, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of bloods. Natural descent is how we um, translate that word. Nor of human decision or a husband's will, but born of God. Our family is eternal in nature and allows us then to love in the same way God loves us. But our family, our connection, our fellowship is supernatural in nature. Our friendship is based on the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Our friendship is based on what God has called us in the realization that we are brothers in Christ. So my friends in Christ, whatever, whatever voices that we may be struggling with collectively, individually, voices that, and they're, and they're tormenting voices, by the way. I, you've, I don't need to tell you this. You know how it feels. You know what worry feels like. It's tormenting. It, it's just painful. It doesn't give you rest. It just prods and prods and prods. And maybe you can, maybe you can distract your mind for a while. Maybe you can go see a movie. Right? But as soon as you get out of that movie theater, it's right there. God is not about giving you a respite. God's about setting you free. Oh my God. He's about setting you free. All of us. And he has the power and the spirit to do it. 
He's called us to be free. Free from the tormenting spirits, free from just the weight of it. Have you just felt the weight of the world lately? You might just, again? You don't have to live like that. He set us free. And in him, by him, through him, all things were made. He holds all things together in his hands. My mind gets free through the word of God. Free. If I don't take a shower, I can get by a day. Depending. I may be able to get by two days. If I'm at the lake fishing, I can't go three. Same is true with the word of God in my mind. If I don't take a shower every day, my mind starts to stink. My thoughts start to stink. <laughs> and my words then start to stink. And people are like, man, your attitude stinks. <laughs> That's because my mind stinks because I haven't washed it. But as we wash, the, wash uh, our minds and get used to that, there's a freedom that we realize in the word of God that's so, so, so powerful. As Jesus says, heaven and earth will pass away. Or as we read in 2 Corinthians, though outwardly, uh, the translation I like that I, that I brought to mind is, and memorizes, though outwardly we are wasting away. Have you noticed that? Inwardly, we're being renewed day by day. Day by day. A new creation. So my friends in Christ, may the word of God that gives us life and the spirit of God that breathes life into us, may we draw our life from him and may we realize the importance of his word, the power of his word, the value of his word, as his word washes us and sets us free from anything and any voice and any influence that is not of God. This I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.